I'm uh, Captain Kevin Brew. I'm the duty lawyer at JMO. I'm the spy embedded in JMO. Um, before we begin, would you please turn off your phones and things of that nature? This is a reminder. The good news about the Naval War College, as many of you know, it's unique in that we have an international law department as well as what we call the Stockton Professor, who is an international lawyer from throughout the world that we bring in and he speaks or he's here to lecture research on various issues. Today we're honored to have Professor Wolf Heinzel von Hennig from Germany. Um, he will speak to us first about cyberspace and international law. I've, hopefully you've got his bio. I asked to be sent out to all the seminar groups. He's uh, a quite amazing man. He's, he's, this is his second time here as the Stockton Chair, I believe. He will be returning to Germany uh, to return to be the Vice President of the Europa Institute University in Frankfurt on Oder. More importantly, he's been involved in many expert working groups with various international lawyers on various manuals, one of which is the San Remo Manual on the application of the law of armed conflict to operations at sea. Another is on air and missile warfare. But more importantly for today, he's been involved in a project known as the Tallinn Manual, which I believe is about to be officially announced perhaps this week in Tallinn, which is dealing with international law and cyberspace. So let's just let him get at it. And now, Professor. Well, good morning. Um, I want to, you to join me into two domains. One of the domains is rather familiar to you. It's called cyberspace. And the other may be frightening to you. It's called law. The problem we have with uh, new technologies is always the same and has always been the same. As soon as a new technology is being used, especially in the security environment, you will see many international lawyers, experts, self-proclaimed experts, um, and others who believe to uh, have an idea of what the law says about that new technology. And what I will try to do today is to introduce you to some aspects of international law that relate to or apply to cyber operations. Now let me give you an overview. First of all, the question of course is, if cyberspace is such a novel phenomenon, can the existing rules of international law, some of which are more than one century old, apply at all to that new technology? If we have uh, more or less settled this issue, we will talk about some of the security issues involving cyberspace, and then we will go into the uh, legal aspects of it, starting with the Tallinn Manual. I will shortly explain the process um, of the Tallinn Manual, and then we will talk about two aspects of international law, one relating to the question of whether a use of force is lawful at all, in interstate relations, and the second, whether and to what extent you are entitled to use cyber means or to conduct cyber operations during an armed conflict. And uh, I will sh close, of course, with some concluding remarks, and I will reserve, I hope, sufficient time for any questions you may have. So let's start with the question of whether the law applies at all to cyberspace. The digital information infrastructure and all kinds of definitions are around there. But I think you are very well aware that indeed cyberspace, which is, as it's rightly said here, uh, the network of networks, digital information infrastructure, etc., etc., which is a global phenomenon, which cannot easily be grasped with if you apply a traditional approach to the law. I think that's quite clear. However, what we must be aware of that uh, it is always a little bit uh, creative, to say the least, if not prohibited, to apply certain legal concepts because they seem to fit. And of course, you all know the labeling of cyberspace as the fifth domain. Others are calling it a global domain. 
and uh, they are assimilating it to the high seas, to outer space, and international airspace. And indeed, there seems to be some logic in that. But you have to be aware that lawyers think a little bit differently, differently than, uh, than other human beings. Um, so if you tell them something like that, they immediately say, oh, then it is something that belongs to all. And no single state may take any action within cyberspace because that would be to the detriment of others. So one should be very hesitant to apply such legal concepts too easily to this phenomenon, which is not that new after all, because we already have the year 2013, don't forget that, and we have been talking about cyber issues and international law for quite a while now. The first conference that was held on these issues took place here at the Naval War College in 1999, and uh, many people have forgotten that. Uh, so then they discovered it only a couple of years ago as a new subject matter, or, or, although the Naval War College had already dealt with a couple of years before, which so shows you that you are here at a very good, creative, and up-to-date institution. Now, if I am saying that those traditional legal concepts do not apply too easily to cyberspace, do we then need new rules? Which is always something that uh, many people believe is the only way of solving certain problems when it comes to international law or even domestic law. Well, new rules seems to be a good idea because it would involve and mean legal clarity, right? But can you imagine today or in two, three, four or five years from now on to have an international conference with 193 states, ideally 193 states participating and agreeing on international law applicable to cyberspace and cyber operations? This will be or would be a horrifying exercise. They cannot even agree on simple things. Certainly they could not agree on that. So I don't think that this is the right way. My approach and that of others has been and continues to be that the existing law is well suited and it will apply to cyberspace and to cyber operations if you apply it in a sober manner. Now, why am I saying that? I'm saying that because the United States president in the International Strategy for Cyberspace has exactly said that. The president has said that the existing rules, principles of international law, do apply. And uh, in order to make it quite clear, this is not only a solitary United States position, but it's also shared by others. Now, you will see that this is a draft strategy of the European Union, so it's not yet accepted by the 27 member states, but there's a good chance that this strategy will be accepted by the member states, and you see here exactly the same approach as the approach by the United States President. So you see that at least the European states and the United States, and I would guess Canada and other like-minded states, would take exactly the same approach. There is no need to reinvent the law or to invent new rules of international law in order to um, deal with cyber security issues. What we have to be aware is that despite of the rather mystified characterization of cyberspace as a fifth domain, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, there is an infrastructure which is necessary for cyberspace to exist at all and to operate. And that infrastructure will, in most cases, be located somewhere. It's not in some nirvana, but it is located in territory. It is connected to the national grid of the respective country. You see that countries do indeed not only claim that the cyber infrastructure located in their territory is protected by the principle of territorial sovereignty, but they also exercise all kinds of jurisdictions. They uh, regulate cybercrime, they enforce their laws, 
when it comes to certain forms of cybercrime. They regulate activities in and through cyberspace. And last but not least, they even regulate and enforce access to cyberspace. There is no evaluation in that finding. Of course, I don't like certain governments to block off internet access because they are afraid of certain political groups, etc., etc. But what we must be aware of is the reality out there. The law and the world is not as I like it to be, but as it is. And that's what states are in fact doing. And states are showing us, every single state, whether a dictatorship or a good democracy that is law-abiding and, of course, pledging allegiance to the rule of law, they all regulate activities in and through cyberspace. They even regulate access to cyberspace. Give you what, but one example. Sweden, which seems to be the uh, well, most democratic, most advanced democracy in the world, they regulate all aspects of cyberspace because they are saying, we are a consensus government. So each time you're using, you're using your smartphone there via internet access or whatever, all data will be stored. Would anybody doubt the democratic character of the Swedish state, the Swedish kingdom? I guess not. So this is a reality. Of course, states protect their cyber infrastructure. They must, by necessity, protect their cyber infrastructure, not only against intru intrusions, but against all transporter um, interference. And the conclusion is, like it or not, the law as it stands, international law as it stands, does indeed apply to cyberspace. The only thing one can say is that because of its characteristics, of course, cyberspace cannot be appropriated by a single state, sure. But on the other hand, the fact that all states are interconnected via cyberspace does not mean that they have waived their territorial sovereignty or their right to exercise jurisdiction over certain cyber activities. Now, having clarified that international law applies, of course, we must be very much aware that uh, there are some very, very uh, uh, considerable security issues. Many economic sectors are heavily dependent on cyberspace. Uh, cyberspace offers new opportunities, business opportunities. You can today make money even though you only have one computer at your home and you, after a while you will be big in business, whatever that business is. But it has been rightly stated that uh, in view of the, those new opportunities offered by cyberspace, uh, the focus was rather on interoperability, speed, reliability, maybe a little bit, but certainly not on the, issue, on the, on the aspect of security. And those new characteristics, openness, ubiquity, name it what you want, they of course have somehow created new vulnerabilities. Um, I very often use the following picture. Uh, imagine I have a safe at my, at my house. It's filled with one mil million dollars. I leave the safe open. I make a sign at my door, which is open. There's the safe with one million dollars. And I go on vacation, and when I return, I find out, oh, the safe is empty. Can I complain about that? It's a little bit the same in cyberspace. Because uh, we are, for example, very often relying on products that uh, everybody can acquire. The vulnerabilities of those products are well known. Still, we are using those products because there seems to be no alternative, for whatever reasons, financial, etc., etc., etc. Now, in view of those new vulnerabilities, uh, the Department of Defense, the U.S. Department of Defense, in its strat strategy for operating in cyberspace, has clearly identified the, dam uh, the vulnerability of the United States and of their allies. And if you see the only the, uh, if you only look at the parts in bold, you will see, yes, all aspects of society can be affected by malicious cyber activities. And of course, uh, it may even result in physical damage and certainly in economic disruption if 
a massive cyber attack is being launched by whoever. The best examples of uh, certain sectors that uh, cannot do without cyberspace are the financial and the banking industries. Uh, they are so heavily interconnected today that even a short interruption of the communications via cyberspace would have rather long-lasting and severe detrimental effects. But also other services which we consider essential, health, water, electricity, etc., they are all dependent on cyberspace. The funny thing, however, is that, uh, or not, that uh, the main actors in that area are private. Private companies and others, and governments do not play such a big role. And uh, some are even saying that the private sector even has a lead role when it comes to guaranteeing and establishing cyber security. Uh, but, as you all know, uh, and many of you may even have been confronted with certain issues of cyber crime, that your account was suddenly empty or the like, and you very well know that uh, there is a heavy organized crime out there that dispose of the means and the will to inflict serious economic damage on almost every one of us. So what is the role of the government if there is this heavy private involvement? Cybercrime on the one hand, private um, enterprises and corporations on the other hand. Do governments play a role at all? Shouldn't they just leave it to the private sector to deal with these issues and then hope that the private sector will come up with some solutions? Well, some are uh, in, indeed in favor of such an approach. They even say that the Cybercrime Convention is a template for cybersecurity as such. Uh, I don't buy into that because for a simple reason. There is a very important public slash military dimension to cyberspace. And I don't want any of our governments to be put on the same footing as organized crime somewhere east of us or uh, west of us, depending on how you look at it. So in view of that, I think the role of governments is uh, still important. And what we must be aware of, there is a very, very uh, important public military dimension to cyberspace. Now, we have seen in the recent past that uh, foreign governments exercise power through cyberspace. And I recommend to you to read that report that was published just a couple of weeks ago. You can easily find it on the internet. What the report tells you is that they were able to track back cyber attacks against the United States to a certain building in China, which shows you that the alleged problem of attributing cyber attacks or cyber operations to a given state or even to a given individual is, of course, big, but it's not an insurmountable problem. And you may also be aware that the United States president has recently reacted by addressing China uh, with regard to the findings that were laid down in the Mendiant report. And there is, there will, those exploitations will continue. Now, how far they go, whether they merely exploit the information resident in the respective cyber infrastructure or whether they even uh, inflict damage on the cyber infrastructure doesn't at the end of the day make too much difference. Because we must be aware that not only the United States, but many other countries are very, very vulnerable uh, against any form of cyber intrusion or cyber attack. Of course, we are trying to increase the resiliency of the cyber infrastructure we are uh, building up defensive capabilities and even offensive capabilities, which I think is, uh, is rightly being done, because without knowledge of the offensive capabilities, how can you defend yourself properly? So there needs to be some offensive capabilities to the least. And, as you all know, modern military operations heavily depend on cyberspace. 
because otherwise mission success would not be guaranteed. So in view of that, in view of the public and military dimension of cyberspace, we must be most serious when we are dealing with the legal issues involved. Now, how did the international discussion start? I already told you, back in 1999, here at the Naval War College, we already talked about those issues. But the international community, I hate that word, but that's what they are, they are calling them, only got aware of it at, uh, with the cyber attacks against Estonia in, back in 2007, and one year later when certain de uh, distributed denial of service attacks were conducted against Georgia in its uh, short-term armed conflict with the Russian Federation. Uh, then suddenly everybody believed that this is a big issue. And of course you all have heard about Stuxnet, which is a rather elegant means of achieving your political goals, what I think, or even the alleged downing of an American UAV over Iran by cyber means. So it plays a role and of course the uh, media are very eager to uh, jump on those subjects and uh, because they are, well, new, uh, they can attract a lot of attention. But again, this is not new. But fortunately enough, those events have triggered an international discussion. And that is the good part of it. <coughs> now if you see that uh, the United States, and not only the United States, but many other countries as well, claim the right that certain cyber attacks if they are significant enough, would trigger the target country's right of self-defense, well, then you must really start to think about what international law says about it. Because seemingly, certain cyber attacks will be considered so grave that not only re a response within cyberspace is an option, but even the use of kinetic means in order to respond to those attacks. So the question then is, what does the law say? Because the determination of the threat should be unambiguous, that should be clear. But what is the law? Well, here's the answer. That's the law. Now, uh, you are in a funny situation here. Why? Because tomorrow in London, this manual will be officially launched but they forgot about us. So we are one day ahead, not really one day because they have the time difference, but 20 hours or so. So that is not the answer to, to the issues I have talked about, but the Tallinn Manual provides some answers to make you aware of that. So what is it? Uh, there, after the cyber attacks against Estonia, uh, they established uh, in close connection with NATO, the uh, Cooperative Cyber Defense Center of Excellence, must be a German who has invented the title, uh, but the thing is that many countries join their efforts with a view to increasing cyber security and cyber defense capabilities. And uh, the idea was to uh, have that process being accompanied by a study group of legal experts who were tasked with identifying which law, uh, rules of international law, which principles of international law apply to cyber operations. And indeed, uh, the group uh, was tasked to do that within a time frame of three years. And if you believe it or not, the group succeeded. Um, the uh, director of the group, uh, was uh, Professor Michael Schmidt, who is also the chairman of the International Law Department here at the Naval War College. We had a group of experts uh, of uh, a couple of countries. Those that are put in, the names of those, uh, those that are put in bold are the members of the drafting committee. In other words, we had to do all the work. Uh, the experts met twice a year, enjoyed Tallinn in winter, which is rather cold, or in summer, 
And uh, they only came there for a couple of days, and we stayed on and had to do the drafting. Uh, but you see, it's a rather mixed group of all, of a variety of different countries. And those who are marked in red were not part of the expert group, but they were observers. And you will see, uh, for example, Colonel Gary Brown, who was then at US Cyber Command as an observer. He now switched sides to the ICRC, maybe because of the Tallinn Manual. Then uh, somebody from the ICRC, and last but not least, from NATO, uh, from Allied Command Transformation. So they were all working on that issue to a varying degree, and they came up with a product after three years. Now what have we done? We dealt with sovereignty. We dealt with the rules of international law relating to the legality of the resort to force. We talked about self-defense, of course. We talked about the uh, law applicable in armed conflict, both international and non-international, about neutrality, occupation, and even zones. And we tried to figure out to what extent the existing rules of international law do indeed apply. Now, the beauty of the process is that uh, you will find two different kinds of statements in the Tallinn Manual. The one is the black letter rule, which in short sentences identifies the applicable law. And those rules have been agreed upon by consensus. So all the experts agreed that this is the law. But uh, as you can imagine, put three lawyers together and give, ask them to give one answer, you won't get it. Of course, the consensus on the black letter rules does not mean that we agreed in every single detail. There were, of course, differences in opinion, different approaches. And those different opinions and competing views are now reflected in the commentary to the respective rules. Now, you may say, so what? Well, I say that is indeed one of the advantages of the manual. Because, like states, it's easy to agree on certain fundamental rules and principles. But, of course, very often the devil lies in the detail. And the different opinions and views that are being clearly stated in the commentary open options for all governments that are willing to make use of the Tallinn Manual. And to my knowledge, there are already some governments that use the Tallinn Manual as a point of reference or as at least a basis for arriving at certain legal conclusions. Now, the question is, what did we find out? Now, first we dealt, apart from other things, with the question, when does a cyber operation violate the prohibition of the use of force as laid down in the Charter of the United Nations? And here you see Article 2.4 of the Charter which clearly prohibits states from resorting to the use of force and even to the threat of force in their international relations. So indeed the question is, for example, was the Stuxnet operation, was that a use of force? And you can imagine that uh, some of the experts had uh, a hard time to cope with that issue. Some of them were not even able to deal with a sophisticated coffee machine, and now they had to answer that question. <laughs> now, of course, as many people do when they are suddenly confronted with a new problem, with a new question, they uh, take what they are familiar with. And they say, yeah, uh, what about the effects? Must it, mustn't it be somehow kinetic or akin to the use of traditional kinetic force, like bombs being dropped, etc., etc. Uh, and the problem is that, uh, the, uh, that, that the respective rule, Article 2.4, has of course been dealt with also by the International Court of Justice, for example, in the Nicaragua case. And in the Nicaragua case, for example, the uh, court found that the arming of guerrillas that were 
conducting operations in and against Nicaragua constituted a use of force. Wow. Without the respective state firing a single shot. But of course the shots were fired by the guerrillas. On the other hand, there was always clarity that not every form of uh, coercion constitutes a use of force. Even though the South American states back in the 1940s and 1950s were very much in favor of assimilating economic sanctions, pressure, etc., to a prohibited use of force, they didn't succeed. So we know there is a clear case when you're dropping bombs, and there is another clear case when you're doing something below that, but of course the problem is what is in between, especially in view of the decision of the uh, International Court of Justice. Now, as you can imagine, uh, of course, a use of a weapon will in every case constitute a use of force even though the weapon does not have any kinetic effects. For example, biological weapons, right? Or a chemical weapon. They are all considered a use of force if one state are using them against another state. So the argument that it must by necessity be of a kinetic nature can be easily rejected by reference to the chemical and biological weapons. But what about uh, the, those other forms of cyber operations? Because, for example, if you are intruding into a foreign system, you are by necessity, necessity changing data when you are intruding. They may not have far-reaching effects, but still you are changing data. What about uh, data theft? What about interference with the operating system off or a SCADA system off? Some very important uh, infrastructure, like, for example, the energy sector or the water sector. Uh, is that a use of force? Now, you have to understand that international law is a very dynamic order. And this is the good side of it. And what we are experiencing now is that we seem to be in some form of intermediate period where states yet have to find out which cyber operations against which critical infrastructure would for them constitute a use of force or be assimilated to a use of force. For example, the uh, well-known uh, scenario of an attack against uh, the New York Stock Exchange because of the potential of far-reaching effects, not only on the United States economy, is uh, very often used to say, but can't we do anything against such an attack if it brings our economy to its knees? Isn't that a use of force? Or even, isn't it even worse than a use of force? Why can't I bombard the capital of the enemy if they have dropped bombs? But why can't I do it if they have ruined our economy and brought it to or have neutralized it almost altogether? And those questions are rightly asked. But there is no clear standard yet. So our idea was to make use of the so-called Schmidt approach, indeed something that was developed by Mike Schmidt. And uh, these are criteria, okay? These are criteria. So if we look at a certain cyber operations, at a certain cyber operation, we will try to evaluate each of those criteria in order to give states the possibility of evaluating whether the fulfillment of these criteria or of one of those criteria is sufficient to consider a cyber operation a use of force. You may say, wow, that is nothing, right? Where is the good hard law which tells me yes or no when I want to uh, come to a conclusion? Well, that's the character of international law. And don't blame us. We are not the creators of international law, even though some of my colleagues would love to do that. And many people do that, unfortunately. But international law is made by states. Okay? And if states have not yet come to a clear consensus 
on whether and to what extent certain cyber operations qualify as a use of force, who am I to say what it is or what it is not? So the only way out was to come up with those criteria and to admit, because that's what you have to do if you are doing serious business in international law, that there is not yet a clear, generally agreed upon standard, period. That's what it is. Like it or not. The other question we dealt with was, well, when do we, or when are we allowed to use force? Well, clearly, there are two situations. The one is the Security Council has authorized it under its powers according to Chapter 7 of the Charter. And as you know, the Security Council has a wide margin of discretion. It could determine that almost every situation constitutes at least a threat to peace and security, and it could then authorize those member states that are willing and able to take the respective measures and to conduct cyber attacks against a given country. The other one, which is much more important, because the problem with the Security Council is a little bit that the permanent five members do not necessarily always share the same views. Uh, they very often go into different directions, as we have experienced, or as we are experiencing right now in, in the case of Syria and in other situations. So, the most important aspect of the use ad bellum is self-defense. But again, it's not that easy. Because if you look at the Charter, it, at the United Nations Charter, Article 51, it clearly states, well, there must be an armed attack. And if an armed attack occurs, then you are entitled to resort to self-defense, and you are not limited, by the way, to respond in kind, even though you may be the target of a massive cyber attack, which constitutes an armed attack, then you may respond with all traditional means and methods of warfare. You don't have to limit your response to cyberspace. All right, so far the theory. But what does it mean? What is an armed attack? And here again, we have exactly the same problems as in the case of what constitutes a use of force. If you look at the Charter, you will see that Article 2.4 only speaks of a use of force, right? And the right of self-defense applies if an armed attack occurs. So seemingly, an armed attack is something different than a use of force. How do you distinguish the two? Well, it's difficult, I, I admit that. But it doesn't mean it's impossible. However, just to be clear on this, the United States and the present administration considers the both to be identical. Uh, they say every use of force is an armed attack and vice versa. Which seems to be a very rational approach, but I don't think that it is politically opportune and there are good legal arguments against it. Uh, all experts came to a contrary conclusion. They say that, of course, every armed attack is a use of force, but not vice versa, meaning not every use of force is an armed attack. The distinguishing factor is severity, meaning that it is a use of force that is of a severe nature, not just a simple use of force, like, for example, the, United, uh, the ICJ, the International Court of Justice, identified certain border clashes as not amounting to an armed attack. So here you can see that uh, that distinction has been accepted. So how do we determine severity? Well, by the scale and effects. But again, the question is, what are the scales and effects and how must they materialize? And here again the discussion has been, well, we agree on the scales and effects approach, but which scale and which effects may we take into consideration in order to arrive at the conclusion that there has been an armed attack? 
Now let me take the Stuxnet example and just let me assume for the argument's sake that a state used that malware in order to accomplish what they wanted to accomplish and indeed did accomplish. Um, if you are looking at what happened, well, it was quite simple. There was sufficient information. The malware was constructed in a very sophisticated manner that uh, certain centrifuges and other parts, most of them provided by a German corporation called Siemens, uh, that were used in Iran for their nuclear program, were manipulated in a way that the centrifuges uh, did not any longer function as they were supposed to function, and that inflicted damage to the centrifuges that did not any longer rotate in the way they should. So the centrifuges were damaged, right? Damage. Were they expensive? I don't care. They were damaged. Okay? Now, was that a use of force? Well, I guess you can say so. You can say so. It was a use of force. But was it an armed attack? Well, I guess there we must be a little bit more cautious. Because if there is a difference between an armed attack and a use of force, the mere fact that damage has been inflicted on those centrifuges, and even though you may consider that to be a use of force, does not necessarily mean that it already constitutes an armed attack. Interestingly, the target state of that operation, meaning Iran, uh, said, well, well, that was not so bad. We uh, can cope with that. They bought some new centrifuges somewhere on the black market, so, okay. Maybe it was a little bit more expensive than before. But obviously, the target state itself did not consider that to be an armed attack, right? Of course, it was embarrassing for them because Stuxnet had been resident there for quite a while and they didn't even notice. But here you see, we must also look at what states do in a given case, and we cannot easily determine as academics that this is an armed attack because we have decided it to be so. So states seem to look at it a little bit differently. But even if you say that you have an armed attack and that you may even respond kinetically with traditional means of warfare, um, you are still bound by certain limits that accompany the right of self-defense. Meaning it must be necessary and proportionate and of course it must be immediate. The other issue that uh, uh, comes up of course immediately is the question of may you respond before the attack has certain effects negative effects on your cyber infrastructure. Meaning, can you preemptively make use of your right of self-defense or anticipatorily? And there are so many uh, different labels to this that I hesitate to use them all. But the simple question is, of course, for a state whose uh, critical infrastructure may be about to be attacked, must it wait until the damage is done or can this, that state respond earlier? Well, interestingly, the experts agreed, yes, of course, the state must not wait until the damage has been inflicted because international law, after all, is not a suicide pact. But of course, in the cyber domain, it is sometimes rather difficult to establish and to determine when and whether an armed attack is about to occur and that there is no other opportunity uh, to prevent the negative consequences than resorting to, because that's what self-defense is about, a use of force. So, what is the conclusion of the Tallinn Manual? Well, it is rather simple. The easiest case is the one in the first paragraph. If there is a cyber operation that indeed results in inflicting injury or death to people or damage and destruction of property, well, then the scale and effects requirement will most likely be fulfilled. And that qualifies as an armed attack. On the other hand, they also agreed that mere cyber intrusions, even if they result in 
data theft, also intellectual property, meaning that you are inflicting harm on the economy of another country because then those uh, products will simply be copied and they don't have, didn't have to spend all that money for research, etc. Still, espionage, whether by traditional means uh, or by cyber means, is not yet prohibited. Why? Everybody does it. And states uh, would not do themselves a favor if they agreed on a prohibition of espionage. On the other hand, there are some others, uh, some other scenarios where the experts simply couldn't come up with a solution. And those are those that have extensive ne negative effects, but those effects are not akin to the use of traditional means of warfare. And here again, the example of New York Stock Exchange was heavily discussed. And you can imagine that almost in all respects, the group was divided at least into three groups very often into three groups plus two or three subgroups that took uh, a differentiated approach. But again, the black letter rule, the substance of the law as such is clear. But of course, we must agree on how it applies to a given situation. But that's again not the duty of academics. That was not the task of the Tallinn Manual. That's something our governments will have to do. Our governments will have to come together, at least those that are like-minded, that have a similar approach to cybersecurity, and must agree on certain standards. And if they do so, and they are in a process of doing that right now, they will come up at some day in the hopefully near future where they have agreed on certain criteria and then we are on a much safer ground with regard to the question of whether a certain operation constitutes an armed attack. Certainly. If you look at what states did after the attacks on Estonia, even though it brought down the entire cyber infrastructure of Estonia for a couple of days, and it had far-reaching effects, but still, even though Estonia would have loved that to be a case of Article 5 of the NATO Treaty, meaning a case of an armed attack against one of the uh, alliance members, the other members said clearly, no way, no way. So the mere fact that you are vulnerable, that you are even very vulnerable against cyber operations, does not by necessity mean that other states would also consider that to constitute an armed attack that would trigger the right of self-defense of the target state. Now that was the first big part of the Tallinn Manual. When may you resort to the use of force? How may you respond to a cyber attack? But then we also dealt with the other issue of uh, conducting military operations in and through cyberspace during an armed conflict. In other words, there is already an ongoing armed conflict between two or more states or in one single state, a non-international armed conflict. And the question has been which cyber operations may you conduct and which then, of course, must be in accordance with the law of armed conflict. And don't forget, uh, there are some examples. But before we dealt with these issues in the relation between the parties to the conflict, we first had a look at neutrality, even though you find that chapter much later in the Tallinn Manual. Because of the characteristics of cyberspace, you will always be, if you are conducting a cyber operation, somehow interfering with states that are not a party to the respective conflict. You will root certain data during that state's cyber infrastructure, etc., etc. And the question then is, wow, what about the obligation of those countries that are not directly participating in the armed conflict Aren't they obliged to be impartial? Aren't they even obliged to prevent certain operations from being conduct conducted from within their territory against one of the belligerents? Well, we all agreed, and that was an approach that had already been taken by the Air and Missile Warfare Manual that was published a couple of years ago, that the, the, the mere fact that you are using 
something like the Internet, and don't forget the Internet is only one aspect of cyberspace, the mere fact that you are conducting certain cyber operations through cyberspace does not mean that this is a violation of neutrality. In other words, the neutral state, even if it becomes aware of a certain cyber operation being conducted via its cyber infrastructure, does not violate its obligations. On the other hand, and that is very important, there is a clear prohibition for neutral states to knowingly allow their territory to be used for acts detrimental to any of the belligerents. And if the neutral state so allows, then the aggrieved belligerent is entitled to respond. So the prohibition of the use of force, for example, does not apply in cases of severe violations of neutrality. So imagine that um, one of the belligerents is conducting a cyber attack from the territory of Utopia. If Utopia has knowledge of that operation, or if it has been informed by one of the belligerents that that attack has been launched or is being launched from its territory, then the neutral state is obliged to terminate that violation of its neutral status. But don't forget, this launching of a cyber attack from neutral territory must be clearly distinguished from an attack that is being conducted through or via the cyber structure of a neutral state. The latter not being prohibited, the former being prohibited. And if there is a serious violation of the neutrality obligations, well, then the neutral state, if it's unwilling or unable to terminate the violation, must tolerate all measures by the aggrieved belligerent to restore the legal status which the uh, neutral state is obliged to preserve. The other question is, of course, what may I target during armed conflict? And uh, here we do have, first of all, the mother of all principles of the law of armed conflict, the principle of distinction. Again, that sounds pretty clear, but the problem is, what does this mean for cyber operations during an armed conflict, especially in view of the fact that cyberspace is run by private actors much, much more than by governmental or military institutions? In other words, the cyber infrastructure within a state will, to 90%, sometimes even more, be of a so-called dual-use character rather than of a genuinely military character. If you have a genuinely uh, military installation, that's no problem. You may, of course, destroy it. You may neutralize it by all means that are not prohibited under the law of armed conflict. So, of course, you can destroy a military cyber infrastructure in another country. But does the interconnectivity of cyberspace mean and the fact that there are so many civilian actors using the same infrastructure as, for example, the enemy's military, does that, that make a cyber attack under the law of armed conflict impossible because you would immediately violate the principle of distinction? Well, the short answer is no. Of course, we must be aware that uh, attacks against civilians and direct attacks against civilian objects are clearly prohibited. There's even a prohibition of reprisals. And there's also the prohibition of indiscriminate attacks, which uh, has very many aspects to it. And you are, of course, always under a clear obligation to limit your attacks during an armed conflict to those objects that qualify as lawful targets. And even if you have identified a lawful target, you must take the necessary and feasible precautions in order to minimize, as far as possible, collateral damage to civilians and to civilian objects. So, after all, it seems cyber operations during an armed conflict are rather difficult to accomplish, right? No. Because we must be aware that the rules, and I'm using here the additional protocol of 1977 only as a reference, okay? 
because the rules are undisputed. The rules I'm referring to here are also recognized, for example, by the United States of America, even though the U.S. has not become a party to the additional protocol. But we all agree that the substance of the articles I am referring to are customary in character and are also binding on the United States. So first of all, we must be aware that there is a clear definition of attacks, and we all agree on that defi definition. It's another attack here, okay? Not the armed attack triggering the right of self-defense. Now we have to do it here with attacks during an armed conflict. And the rules I've just referred to, principle of distinction, uh, prohibition of indiscriminate attacks, etc., etc., they all apply to a given conduct, meaning attack. Even though the language in other articles is a little bit loose in the protocol because it uh, very generically only refers to military operations, we can easily deduce from those rules that after all it means all attack. So when it comes to the prohibition of collateral damage, it's about attacks. When it comes to precautions, it's about attack and not about operations. I'm saying that because there may be many cyber operations uh, that are more akin to propaganda or something alike, which of course you may conduct without being limited by the principle of distinction and the other rules I've just referred to. So it's only about attacks. And attacks are defined as acts of violence. And an act of violence means that there must be certain consequences, like death and injury to individuals and destruction or, and that's the important point, damage to an object. So that is all agreed upon. And we also can again refer to the uh, examples of biological and chemical weapons that it need not be kinetic in character, okay? So that's all agreed. But what does that mean in the consequence? Well, first of all, any cyber operation, or cyber attack rather, of which you can reasonably expect that it will inflict or will cause death, injury, destruction, or damage, constitutes an armed attack. That does not mean that the, those effects must materialize in the real world. They can indeed be limited to cyberspace. But the mere fact that data have been manipulated, that data have been interfered with, that data in some or the other form have been modified, as such is never enough. We will may be there in some distant future from now. But today, Mere interference with data does not qualify as an attack. And be grateful for that, because you may interfere with your enemy's data without being limited by principle of proportionality, etc., etc. You have a rather wide margin of discretion. So interference with data is not an attack. Good. But what is then an attack? Well, remember destruction or damage. How do you define damage? Well, if I damage my car, I know it's damaged because somebody must repair it. It must, that person must, in other words, uh, reinstall functionality, right? Because I cannot use it otherwise. If it's damaged, the functionality has been somehow detrimentally affected. So if something needs to be repaired, that's a clear indication that damage has been inflicted on an object. So how do you translate that? to the cyber world? Well, I guess uh, quite simply by saying even though there may be no material damage to the cyber infrastructure in another state, but if you must reinstall the entire operating system, that certainly amounts to a repair. And if you agree with that, then the operation con constitutes and qualifies as an attack, right? and you would be bound by the respective rules. But the mere fact that secondary or tertiary effects are the consequences of a cyber operation does not mean that this amounts to an attack. To give you a sim simple example, New York Stock Exchange again, okay? Um, the mere fact that a broker is so desperate that he jumps out of the window 
Well, yeah, that's uh, bad, but that's certainly only a secondary or even a tertiary effect, okay? So the fact that you have attacked or conducted an operation against New York Stock Exchange does not mean that you have inflicted death or injury by that operation because there is no direct link to that. But as you can imagine, again, two lawyers, five different answers, that was a compromise position and uh, there are many details where the experts either disagreed or didn't, weren't able to come to a solution. But at least the substance is clear. Now, since cyberspace is so heavily dependent on private actors, just a short clarification. We have heard so much about direct participation, about civilians being prohibited from actively taking part in the hostilities. Forget that, that is wrong. There is no prohibition for civilians to directly participate in hostilities. So a government is free to use its regular armed forces or any other governmental agency, even though that agency does not qualify as military. Okay? Uh, the dark side of it is, to put it short, don't get caught. Okay? Because as uh, a member of the regular armed forces, you have a certain privilege. You enjoy combatant immunity. Nobody may prosecute or punish you for what you have done during an armed conflict, apart from war crimes, of course. Okay? So you may kill, you may destroy, you may injure, you may damage, because that's your job. And nobody can complain about it in an armed conflict, as long as you do it in accordance with the law, of course. But a civilian doesn't have that privilege. Even though the civilian is not prohibited from conducting an attack during an armed conflict, well, the civilian does not enjoy combatant immunity. So if that civilian gets caught by the enemy, bad for him. He is an unlawful combatant. He may be prosecuted and punished for having directly participated. But there's yet another aspect to it. You may want to target that civilian, right? Because that civilian is in a position to inflict serious damage on your military operations, for example. And there the law is again very clear. Direct participation by a civilian means that that civilian is not any longer protected as a civilian. You may target that civilian. So if a, even if a 16-year, or make it more drastically, a 14-year-old young man, I think that's what you have to call them, is actively and directly participating in hostilities, you may kill him. You may kill him. That's the consequence at least for such time that he is so directly participating. Now, the question, of course, is what is direct participation in hostilities? Unfortunately, the International Committee of the Red Cross had the brilliant idea of publishing an interpretive guidance of what they consider direct participation in hostilities. Um, in the, originally, they had tried to do that with the consent of international experts. Mike Schmidt and I and others being part of that group of experts. We moved out, we withdrew our names because we said, what you have done here is not a sober interpretation of international law. What you have done here is with wishful thinking and developing the law into a direction which does not reflect the present consensus of states. But unfortunately, the thing is out there. And lawyers are lazy people, unfortunately so. They like to have a, a huge number of footnotes. And what do you see? See also the interpretive guidance by the RCRC, and then they believe that is the law, that they have correctly identified the law. Well, they have not, because the RCRC in many points is simply wrong. But of course, the difficulties remain. When does a certain activity amount to a direct participation? For example, what is the designing of malware, which is not specifically intended to be used in armed conflict? I think everybody can agree that this is not direct participation. 
because a munitions factory worker is not directly participating in hostilities for the mere fact that he is manufacturing munition or even weapons. So we can, can agree on that. But uh, if they are maintaining a computer system, for example, that is crucial for a given military operation, well, then that civilian is clearly participating in hostilities. So, what have we achieved? You may say, not much. Well, I would object to that. We have achieved quite a lot. Because, as the United States President has uh, said in 2011, this is a necessary first step to identify whether and to what extent the rules of international law applying to the use of force in interstate relations and to the right of self-defense, we need to clarify those. And the Tallinn Manual is a contribution to that process of clarification. Now, as, as you can imagine, there are already the critics out there, even though the launching will be tomorrow. But the critics are, have already gathered. And there are two groups of critics. The ones say, ah, you have invented new rules. And the others are saying exactly the contrary. They are uh, saying, you are being slaves of the traditional rules of international law, the lex lata, the rules as they stand. Why haven't you used uh, your ima imagination, your creativity? Well, the short answer is, because that was not our task, and that is not what we wanted to do. What we wanted to do was to identify which rules of the existing international law apply to cyber operations, and if so, to what, to what extent. We, again, are not the creators of international law. That is the prerogative of states, and not of NGOs, not of academics. So our task was merely to look at the law and see, does it apply or not? And if so, what does that mean in the concrete circumstances of the case? So there is no progressive development in there. And if you want to, yes, we were slaves to the law as it stands today. And it may well be that in two or three years from now, there must be a second edition of the Tallinn Manual because states will have, in the meantime, agreed on criteria, standards, and even more elaborated rules that we, of course, then must take into consideration. But as of today, or tomorrow, March 15 or 14, 2013, that's what you have. That's what you have. So the Tallinn Manual is clearly a restatement of the existing law. Clearly. Then, of course, there are others who are saying, ah, look at the group. United States, United States. United Kingdom, Germany, uh, this is a Western thing, right? How dare you? What about geographical proportionality, without which you can never ever identify existing rules of international law? Well, welcome to dreamland. Uh, I remember when we drafted the San Remo Manual on the law of naval warfare, and when we drafted the Air and Missile Warfare Manual, that we were desperately looking for somebody from Russia, China, other countries, and we didn't find anybody. We didn't find anybody. Neither by personal contacts, nor by a research with regard to what has been published in those countries. So the short answer is, there was simply a lack of experts. And don't forget, geographical proportionality is only necessary if it comes to identifying new rules of international law. But we limited ourselves to identifying the existing law, as it already exists, as it already stands, as states agree upon, right? So there was no necessity of ask, for asking somebody from Utopia, or Demonia, or Ruritania, whether he or she shares our findings. Hey, after all, we are experts, okay? 
so we know how to deal with the law. Now, the other problem is, of course, remember what I t told you about cybersecurity issues? Can we really continue on the way that was taken by the Tallinn Manual? Can we continue to make that clear distinction between the private sector and cybercrime on the one hand and a public state military sector on the other hand? Shouldn't we rather uh, have a holistic, a new nice word that is so, already, so often being misused, holistic approach, transparency, uh, yeah, shouldn't we take that rather than having that sectorial approach to cybersecurity? Well, again, this is the first step. This first step does not rule out that it will be further developed in the near and far future. States may consider that to be the right approach. They may say, well, we must do something about the existing law. But, it, but, but I think this distinction is valid and continues to be valid. Again, I don't want any of our governments to be put on the same footing as a member of the mafia or of some, some other organized crime organization. Cybercrime is an issue, no question. It is an important aspect of cybersecurity, no question. But this does not mean that governments should waive their right to conduct certain operations, even in cyberspace, and even though that operation, if conducted by a civilian, would be considered an ordinary crime. But that is the difference, and rightly so. Governments have certain privileges a civilian simply doesn't have. And they may do things civilians simply may not do. And that is the right way of approaching cybersecurity. So it may well be that we have, with the Tallinn Manual, somehow interrupted a process that some would have liked to be or constitute a holistic approach to cybersecurity without a distinction between the public and the private sector any longer. But I think we have uh, added something to legal clarity and thus to legal security, and we will have to wait and see whether and to what extent governments are willing to take up what we have come up with and I am proud to say that many governments have already told us informally, of course, hey, we like what you did. So if that's the case, why should we then be too nervous about what, we'll, what the future will bring? So, ladies and gentlemen, it's up to you now. You have uh, 18 minutes. 